This is part three of three on chapter five, biological membranes. In this section, we're gonna be looking at this question, how does the plasma membrane help maintain homeostasis? So we're actually gonna be looking at how the plasma membrane works in cells. These plasma membranes are biological membranes that we've been looking at. They are considered to be selectively permeable. So they're selectively permeable plasma membranes Selectively permeable means that the membrane, it can allow certain molecules to enter in. It can keep in other molecules like metabolic intermediates. They can remain inside of the cell so that the cell can keep those and continue working with those. And then finally, the plasma membrane also allows waste products to exit out of the membrane. So this membrane, it allows things to move in and out of the cell, but it can also prevent certain molecules from moving in and out. So it's selective in what can go across. So there's different types of transport that can occur across this plasma membrane. One type of transport is called passive transport. Passive transport does not require any input of energy, so molecules are going to be considered going down or with their concentration gradient. So one type of passive transport is called passive diffusion. So this is when we have diffusion of a solute through or across a membrane without the use of any transport protein. So these solutes are going to go from an area where they're in high concentration, move across the membrane, and they'll end up going to the area that has less concentration. So that's when we say they're moving down or with their concentration gradient. Besides passive diffusion, another type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, solutes are still going to move down their concentration gradients. They're going to go from areas where they're in high concentration to areas where they're in lower concentration. But in order to go down this gradient, these solutes have to move through a membrane that has a transport protein in it. So these solutes are usually bigger or they have some type of charge to them where they can't just go through passive diffusion. They have to move through some type of protein to go from one side to the other. This slide is showing the two different types of passive transport that we've talked about. So on the left hand side we have diffusion. This is again where molecules move from an area where there's high concentration, so from the top of this membrane, to an area where they're at lower concentration, so towards the bottom. So again, this is diffusion. It doesn't use any energy. The other type of passive transport is called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated just means that there has to be a helper. So these molecules are still going from high to low concentration, so they're still going to move from the top to the bottom of the membrane on the right-hand side. But in order to move across this membrane, they have to move through some type of transport protein. And the transport protein is shown in blue, and it's embedded into that phospholipid bilayer, into the membrane. Due to the nature of phospholipids and this phospholipid membrane that cells have, the phospholipids, they create a barrier for hydrophilic molecules, so those water-loving molecules, and also they create a barrier to ions due to that phospholipid bilayer having a hydrophobic interior. So remember, phospholipids, they have those two fatty acid tails that are hydrophobic, and they face in towards the middle, so they face towards each other. So gases and a few small uncharged molecules can pass diffusively, diffusively across the membrane. So these are really small molecules, so things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and some really small molecules. Larger molecules or ions or any type of polar molecule that's hydrophilic, they can diffuse more slowly. Some of these even larger molecules cannot diffuse at all. They have to use facilitated diffusion. So they have to move through a protein to go from one side of the membrane to the other side. So this image is showing different types of molecules and how easily they can move across the membrane. So up at the top we have our gases, and our very small uncharged molecules. So things like I mentioned, like oxygen, nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide, 
and then also ethanol, which is a very small molecule, they will diffuse across the membrane very, very easily. Bigger molecules like water, urea, they can still diffuse across. Um, they don't diffuse across as easily, so it takes them a little bit longer. And then towards the bottom, we have glucose, which is a polar molecule. We have ions. We have really large macromolecules, which include the proteins, the nucleic acids, polysaccharides, those are those big carbohydrates, um, amino acids. These larger molecules and ions, they cannot just passively diffuse across the membrane. So these molecules, these are the molecules that need that facilitated diffusion, they need a protein to get across. Cells use passive diffusion to help maintain different types of gradients. So living things are in this relatively constant internal environment, so they have to maintain this homeostasis, which includes maintaining temperature, maintaining pH, and also maintaining these different chemical gradients. So these internal environments are usually very different compared to the external environment, so it's outside of the cell. There's two different types of gradients that we see in cells, so there's transmembrane gradients and ion electrochemical gradients. Transmembrane gradients is when you have a concentration of a solute, so of a molecule, it's just higher on one side of a membrane compared to the other side. So here we have glucose, which is the blue molecule shown in the image, and then we have our plasma membrane. So outside of our plasma membrane, you have lots and lots of glucose, whereas if you look inside your membrane, you only have two glucose molecules. So this is considered to be a gradient because you have high concentration on one side, low concentration on the other side. Some of these gradients are ion or electrochemical. So this is when you have an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient. So this one's a little more complex. So we have different types of ions inside and outside of our cell. So we have chlorine, um, sodium, potassium ions. And you can see outside of the cell you have a lot of sodium ions which are positive in charge. And if you look inside of the cell, you have a lots of chlorine atoms that are inside of your cell. So not only do you have a difference in how these ions are distributed in and out of the cell, you also have a positive charge outside, a negative charge inside of the cell. So you have that electrical gradient as well. We can refer to these gradients and it's called a tonicity. So an isotonic solution is when you have an equal amount of water, an equal amount of solute concentration on both sides of the membrane. So isotonic basically means that you don't have any concentration gradient. Everything is equal on both sides. And you can see that in the image here. So solute concentration outside the cell is isotonic to inside the cell. So it's equal. Other times we're going to have hypertonic solutions. So this is where the solute concentration is higher, water concentration is lower on one side of the membrane compared to the other side. So the side of the membrane that has more solute and less water, that's the hypertonic side. And then the other side has um, less solute and more water dissolved in it. The opposite of hypertonic is hypotonic. So this is when your solute concentration is lower, thus water concentration is higher on one side of the membrane compared to the other side. So here in this image, we have fewer solutes outside the cell compared to inside the cell, shown on the image. So sometimes, instead of having the solutes move across, so if the solutes cannot move across, like they're too big, there's no proteins to help them move across, water can move across instead. So water, it can diffuse through a membrane, and it also follows these rules, so it goes from an area of where there's lots of water, where you have a high concentration of water, to an area where there's less water, where you have a lower concentration of water. And this is called osmosis. And basically it's just the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. That's what osmosis is.
So osmotic pressure, all cells have osmotic pressure. This is the tendency of water to move into any cell. And osmotic pressure, it helps the cells to um, be plump. It helps plants stand up against gravity. So osmotic pressure is a good thing for cells. Depending on what environment cells are placed into, different things can happen. So first we'll just look at animal cells. So using a red blood cell, in an isotonic environment, red blood cells maintain their normal shape. So they look like the little disc shaped cells up at the top. If you take a red blood cell and you put it into a hypertonic environment, so remember hypertonic environment, there's going to be more solutes and less water outside the cell versus inside the cell. So in a hypertonic environment, the water inside the cell is going to flow out of the cell. This causes the blood cell to shrivel up and it's called crenation. So hypertonic environment is bad for animal cells. It causes our cells to shrivel up. If we take a red blood cell and we go to the right, we put in a hypotonic environment. So hypotonic environment, there's lots of water, very few solutes outside of your cell. This water is going to flow into the red blood cells because water is going to go from high to low concentration. And because red blood cells don't have a cell wall or anything, the water is going to keep on flowing into the red blood cell until that cell may eventually burst open and then that cell will die from this. So hypotonic environment for animal cells is also bad. The ideal environment for animal cells is an isotonic environment. If we compare this to a plant cell, so up at the top we have a plant cell that's in an isotonic environment. If that plant cell goes in a hypertonic environment, the water's going to flow out, that cell's going to shrivel up. And in plants that's called plasmolysis. And if you've ever had a plant, you've probably seen this if you forget to water them, the plant will shrivel up, the leaves will kind of droop. And that's the cells losing water. If we go to the right, if we put our plant cell into a hypotonic environment, basically you water the plant, the water's going to flow into the cell, it builds up turgor pressure, that pressure pushes against the cell wall, so these cells are not going to burst open, they're only going to fill up with so much water due to that cell wall. And this is when we have a nice plant that can stand up against gravity. So plant cells, they really want to be in a hypotonic environment. They want to have water in their cell. They want to have this turgor pressure. So just to quickly remind you, we were talking about passive transport. And we have two different types here. So we have diffusion. And you can have diffusion of small molecules or the diffusion of water, which is called osmosis. The other type of passive transport we talked about is facilitated diffusion. And this again, molecules are moving from high to low concentration, but they have to move through some type of protein helper, so it's facilitated. So these transport proteins or these facilitator proteins, they provide that passageway for movement of ions and hydrophilic molecules, or even really large molecules. And there's two types of transport proteins that can be used in facilitated transport. And they have channel proteins and transporter proteins. So channel proteins, they're just channels. Most of them are gated, so they can be closed at certain times. But when they open up, molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. One special type of protein channel is an aquaporon. Aquaporons are to help water move from high to low concentration. So if you remember water, it can flow across plasma membranes, but it doesn't flow very easily. So if a cell wants to move water very quickly, they just have these aquaporon proteins embedded in their membrane. The water can flow very, very easily. Other types of proteins are called transporters. These proteins, they're usually a little more specific. They transport one type of solute from one side over to the other. And these proteins, they have to have a conformational change. So you can see we have a solute, it enters into the protein pocket, 
that protein changes shape and that solid can move out towards the other side. There's three types of transporters. We have uniporters. They move a single solute in one direction. So this is up at the top on the image. We have our uniporter. So we have a purple circle coming into the transport protein in the top, and it goes out the bottom. Another type of transport protein is a symporter or co-transporter. This is just when you have two solutes moving in the same direction. So this is the image in the middle. We have kind of the orange, orange circle and the blue triangle. They both go in at the top and they come out of the bottom. So two of them moving in the same direction. The third type is an antiporter. This is when you have molecules moving in opposite directions. So we have a blue molecule going from top to bottom and then we have this pink rectangle that goes from bottom to top. So two solutes moving in opposite directions. So far we've only been looking at passive transport where things go from high to low concentration and no energy is used. But sometimes cells want to go the opposite direction and they want to do active transport. So this is when we want to move molecules against their concentration gradient. So we actually want to go from regions where you have low concentration and move things back to a higher concentration. And energetically, in the universe, this is very unfavorable. So in order to do this, the cell has to input energy to go from low to high concentration. And this active transport is shown on the left-hand side of this image up here. So we want to take these white triangles and we want to move them from the bottom, where they're in low concentration, to the top, where they're in higher concentration. In order to do this, we have to use energy, and we use energy in the form of ATP, or adazine triphosphate. So these white triangles, they enter into a protein. You have to use energy to pump those hydrogen ions, those white triangles, from low to high. Our last type of transport is called bulk transport, or exocytosis and endocytosis. So this is when we want to transport really large molecules like proteins, polysaccharides, and very, very large particles. So we're gonna be looking at exocytosis and endocytosis, and there's three different types of endocytosis. Exocytosis, think of an exit sign, this is when a cell is trying to move things out of the cell. So if a cell wants to get rid of a lot of waste, it wants to secrete something like hormones or some other type of molecule, it's going to use exocytosis. So you put the cargo or the large molecules inside of a vesicle. That vesicle moves out towards the plasma membrane. It fuses with the plasma membrane. And then that cargo, those molecules are pushed out of your cell. The other type is called endocytosis. This is where the cell wants to bring things in to the cell. So here we have on the left hand side we have cargo. It gets picked up by receptors. This cargo is brought into the cell inside of a vesicle and then that cargo can fuse with other molecules or can be released. This slide is from a different book, but it's showing the different types of transport that we can have. So we can have passive transport, either diffusion or facilitated diffusion. You can have active transport, which uses energy to go against a concentration gradient. And then our third type of transport is bulk transport, and you can either have exocytosis or endocytosis.